Um, my name is Ryan Gavin. I'm the general manager for AI and ML uh, for Amazon Web Services. I'm going to be joined by Larry Pizzette, who heads up our solutions lab. Uh, and today, we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking through some of the best practices that we have from our solutions lab. Uh, and I'm going to let Larry tell you a little bit more about what that is and what that looks like. But I'm going to give a little bit of context right up front. I don't know, it's day three. I hope you don't even need to teach you that machine learning is experiencing a renaissance. Uh, this is, crowd probably knows that more than most. You know, these concepts have been around for 50 years. The first deep learning paper was written 30 years ago. But it's really the cloud that has a unique set of characteristics with respect to being able to store virtually unlimited amounts of data at relatively low cost. Uh, the analyst estimates now that by 2025, there'll be 5.2 zettabytes of machine learning analyzable data in the cloud, which is 50 times more than just three years ago. You couple the data with compute, and the cloud gives you this very, very rich access to highly performant compute options, GPUs, with per second billing that you can use when you need to, turn it off when you don't, to run these models at scale, and to give a democratization of machine learning capability that really was only limited to a bunch of highly funded tech companies just a few years ago. And then of course, underpinning all this is analytics and security, because this is your data, and it's your most important asset. And because of this, there is this transformation that is absolutely happening. And it's been talked about a bunch today in a lot of the keynotes, but it's happening across every industry. This is leaping outside of tech. Andrew Ning was talking about how this is you know, moving outside of software into virtually every industry, and that's incredibly real. You know, it really kind of breaks down, uh, you know, if you look at a lot of the customers that we get to work with, it's way over simplification, but there's kind of two broad applications that are happening right now at a fairly large scale. The first is AI and machine learning taking out some of the undifferentiated heavy lifting of tasks that we all do in our business. Forecasting, demand generation, marketing segmentation, contact centers. And there's very few companies that specialize in making a contact center a or a differentiation. But everyone, every company has to have value and put energy behind their contact center and their support as their first line to many of their customer interactions. Turns out AI and ML can do a unique job improving customer satisfaction while reducing the cost of running your contact center. So there's a bunch of undifferentiated heavy lifting that AI can improve and ML can improve. On the other side of the spectrum is competitive differentiation. How can ML, based on your data, help you actually transform and have unique insights, unique experiences that can truly give you a leg up to relative to competition? And it should touch everybody, CMO, CFO, et cetera. At Amazon, we have a planning process. Uh, we call it OP1, Operational Plan 1, and Operational Plan 2. This is for every division in the company has to write these documents for our operational plan. And there's a, a mandatory question in that document that everyone has to answer. Whether you're in finance, HR, all the way through to our product and engineering team, sales, et cetera. And the question is, how are you using machine learning to improve your business? And there's a parenthetical that says, not answering is not okay. Like the expectation that every business leader and every organization are using these technologies to transform is foundational. And we've been doing it for decades, but even we need to make sure we're prompting and pushing the next tier of innovation across this. And you see this now happening across customers of all shapes and sizes. HSBC, seventh largest bank in the globe, they have this common problem that I bet you a lot of people in this room, who in this room thinks their company intranet site is awesome? Like, you can find what you want instantly, super, super clear where those documents are. Where's my 401k information? Like, it's a disaster. No one raises their hand whenever I ask this question. HSBC looks at this and says, hey, ML can help. We can use things like Comprehend to index our documents and use natural understanding to find and catalog all, catalog all the documents that were being put into our system. And then we can build a chatbot. They used uh, Amazon Lex in this case to provide a natural language interface for their employees. So when they say, where's that pay stub application? Or how much am I allowed to expense when I go to Vegas on a boondoggle trip at Remars? <laughs> None of you. Uh, they can get faster and easier insights. Now, is this gonna totally transform HSBC? 
No, but is this gonna really materially allow them to spend more time focusing on their customers? Absolutely. And this is the tip of the spear. Intuit, as you heard, hopefully in Werner's keynote, they've been doing machine learning for years. But it turns out now because of the cloud, you can take processes that were six months to build a machine learning model to determine the tax deductions for our customers for a full year of receipts, and they can build that same model in a week. And Larry will touch on that a little bit in terms of the experience of their going through the solutions lab. How many were in Werner's keynote? If you saw the NFL transforming the fan experience, reimagining, how do we think about player performance and analyzing player performance? GE Healthcare, they were just in this room, doing incredible work, incredible work, moving healthcare from something that is reactive to something that is far more proactive. When you have medical imaging and you've got a, uh, a doctor who's been you know, at the end of a 12-hour shift and radiologist and looking at CAT scans and he's looking at CT scans, and it turns out machine learning can help that doctor incredibly at identifying pathologies proactively, oftentimes before there's a problem. And this is happening across every industry of every shape and size. Uh, and I want to touch on one and go a little bit deeper on one, which is Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball is a customer that went through our solutions lab, and Larry will give you some more depth on it. Uh, but before I talk about what they did, let me show you just a short video. Score. I don't know what pitch he's going to run on, but he's not there to stand on first base. Well, he's forcing now Adovino and the defense now to throw sliders. You have to focus on buys. Again, buys against the off-speed pitch this year has just been phenomenal. That success probability takes into account Gore's speed, which he uses here without a throw. Don't even bother. So I don't know how many baseball fans in the room, uh, but if you're a machine learning fan, what's happening here is really pretty cool. What they're doing is predicting the probability of a runner successfully getting from first to second using a deep learning model that takes into account everything from that player's historical jump time, how fast they get off the bag, what, how quickly the catcher can get up and throw the ball, how long does it take for the pitcher's ball to go from his glove or his hand, rather, to the mitt, the historical context, the in-game context, and they build this model, and the way it works is when a player hits first base and there's no one on second, a model, a, a request for prediction is sent to AWS through SageMaker, and it returns a model, and that return happens in 128th of a millisecond. And that model has 21 inferences, or 21 predictions, that are triggered by the distance that the runner is from the bag. So every time the runner moves, it delivers another prediction. If he moves back, it gives another prediction. And it's able for the Major League Baseball to provide a real-time prediction analysis of the likelihood of that runner successfully getting to the next base. It's incredibly fascinating because now you can look at and have a different insight into the game that you never saw before, and it's showing up in how MLB analyzes the games that they talk about. It's a short lead, and when you have this short of a lead, the percentages are 67% from that spot that he's gonna make it. Well, Joe, what are you looking for? 75 or above for Major League Baseball, and then you say, hey, we got a chance to steal that bag. I want a 75% chance. As you see here, it starts at 63, he extends to his maximum lead, it's gonna be 67%. You got no shot. You got a left-handed pitcher, nobody runs on why, because he's so quick, and a catcher that gets rid of the ball quick. You're done. So situation, the pitcher on the mound, and being able to run on the catcher, none of those things were, were applied in this. So it wasn't a very wise. So this is stuff that's happening right now in real time, uh, and it is transforming industries. But the truth is, the journey can look a little bit like this. Uh, and I know you are all very senior decision makers, engineers, data scientists, and so I apologize for the cartoonish depiction. Um, but we've been through this with hundreds of customers, literally hundreds of customers, uh, and this is sometimes what it looks like and feels like. Um, typically, there's someone in the room who just read a white paper or maybe saw a TV commercial. They're a decision maker, they look a little bit like me, they're wearing a sport coat for some reason, and they're showing up and they're like, I've got an idea, we're gonna use AI and ML, we're gonna transform our business, it's gonna be incredible. Uh, and there's a lot of energy and aspiration. And then they quickly realize this requires a very specialized skill set. If you're a machine learning practitioner, you've probably been hired by one of the tech companies. Uh, and so their existing skills aren't going to get them there, and they've got to start training and building out new skills inside of their organization. Then they realize their data is all over the place. 
Turns out data is in various silos. Some organizations covet data and aren't sharing data across. Sometimes data is not in the cloud, so it's not accessible. Then that data needs to be labeled. And then you start to get to the art of the possible. This is when kind of the energy comes back in. A data scientist or machine learning developer will build something that can show what's going to be possible and can show a proof of concept. And then you hit this next stag stage, which I call the pit of cultural acceptedness. And I will tell you, it's uh, very, very real. I was recently in a room full of marketers. I'm not going to rat out who. But a bunch of data scientists built a new marketing segmentation that allowed them to more efficiently target their campaigns, like the emails they send. And they could get a much better target segmentation targeting. Uh, and they were able to offer upwards of a 3 to 4x return over what the existing results were going to be. The marketers in the room had a very negative reaction. Why? Because this new segmentation meant the number of emails that were getting sent out instead of going to, let's say, a half a million people, were only going to go to 120,000 people. And the marketer's like, no, but I need to be able to say I reached a half a million people. And the data scientist is like, are you crazy? You're going to reach 120,000 people and get 3x the return. But it was culturally, it was, it was, they couldn't get their head around it. Like, there is this. And then when they asked the data scientist, well, can you explain why you picked those individuals? Well, that's what our model told us. And you can imagine how that went around. <laughs> uh, so hopefully, you have to work through that kind of cultural acceptance. And it does require transformation at every level. And then you get into kind of the planes of production ready. And one of the secret things that a lot of people don't realize when they hit this point is once you're really ready to run inference at scale, 90% of the cost of machine learning is right there. 90% of the cost of machine learning is in running an inference at scale. And if you make it out of that, then you get to business transformation. Our goal is it for it to look a little bit like this. We don't want to diminish the enthusiasm, but we think ideating a business outcomes, developing your strategy, equipping your teams, iterating quickly, and then scaling and deploying to production while having the cultural transformation and the business transformation happening underpinning that is the key. And that's what Larry and the Solutions Lab has been doing for several years now. So help me to welcome to the stage Larry Pizzette. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. And as Ryan said, really appreciate everyone coming out very last session of the last day. So as Ryan mentioned, I lead the Amazon Machine Learning Solutions Lab. And the Machine Learning Solutions Lab is a program that we have for helping our customers to adopt machine learning workloads. We work in the US, Europe, Middle East, Africa, Asia Pacific. And we work across business areas, worked in manufacturing, finance, healthcare and life sciences, insurance, food production, and quite a bit in professional sports, as Ryan um, showed the, the, uh, the video earlier. So we work with all the stakeholders. Um, as, as Ryan was talking about, the data scientists and the marketers. We work with the, the business leads, the IT folks, the data scientists. We work with all of these different stakeholders through the steps of deploying a machine learning workload, starting from the ideation through to the um, move into production. So what I've compiled for today is five key learnings that I, I think are really important takeaways for getting your organizations engaged in deploying machine learning workloads. First, ideate. Second, know where your data is coming from. Third, train your organization. Fourth, iterate frequently. And five, move to production. I'll step into each of these a little more deeply. So first, it's really important to ideate on the business outcomes. And, and Ryan was talking about a, a um, situation with, with marketing. And that's, that's a, a real situation in the sense that you want to know what those business outcomes are. We have this process at Amazon that we call working backwards, where we start always from what the outcome is that we want, the business outcome. And we work back from that to say, what are we going to do to achieve that? And ideation for machine learning is no different from that. So what we, it's important to get the key stakeholders in the room. And for machine learning, the key stakeholders are typically the business leaders, those folks that have a vested interest in the outcome, that own the results. The IT folks, because it's going to take a lot of data, typically, for machine learning. And you want to know where that data is going to come from. And, and having those IT folks in the room to be able to participate so when folks come up with an idea, they can say, hey, we can get the data, or we can't get the data. That's really important. And then also to have the data scientists in the room is, is hugely impactful 
as well. What we usually recommend is to start out by ideating on approximately six use cases that have meaning to the business, typically ones that you could accomplish within about the three to six month period. And then to whittle that down to one that you can start working on in that three to six month period. Something that's meaningful, but it's not boiling the ocean to get you going, to get your organization going. For example, we just um, finished up a proof of concept with a publishing company where we did that exact process, got all the different stakeholders in the room, whittled it down to six, and then we got it down to one, and then figured out where the data is coming from and um, implemented a model that will tell the, um, or predict what, um, resources that, or what references that the publisher should check to verify the content before publishing it. It's a real efficiency gain for them, and right now they're starting to move that into production. So the next step is to, um, let's see what we got up here, is to develop your data strategy. Now, developing your data strategy is super important, and it's important for the organization to know what this is. And to just to convey the level of data that machine learning could take, a, a simple example is if you wanted to develop a computer vision model from scratch to identify dogs, you would need thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of images of dogs. And if you think about dogs, they're different shapes, different sizes, different breeds, right? You could take those pictures from different angles, and you would want to do that so that you could know and train your models to identify dogs, your computer vision models. Typically, we use convolutional neural networks for that, and you'd want to train those. But you'd also need a large number of images trained as not dogs because, or excuse me, labeled as not dogs, because when, after you're done training, tuning your model, you're going to want to validate your model and make sure your model's predicting those pictures of dogs, but not the other ones that aren't dogs. So you want to be able to validate your models. It takes a lot of data. When we go into organizations and we do the ideating, and then we start that next step and ask the question, where's the data? It's really helpful to have the IT folks in the room. Sometimes we ask the question, where is the data? And people know where the data is. They say it's in that organization over there, but they don't really want to share it with us, right? That, that happens a lot. It's, sometimes it's amazing how much it happens. And so it's important to be able to get the data. We have a great service for that, our simple storage service. It's frequently used for data repositories, frequently referred to as data lakes, that we use for, um, or our customers use for keeping their data. Now, Understanding the data is very important, too. When you think about the data, it's really important to know the quality of the data. Is it accurate data? Are there missing values? And what the data means, what the provenance of the data is, the, um, so you know where it came from. Because if you're depending predictions on this data, you want to know that the data is accurate that you're using in your models. To go back to the... Um, the Major League Baseball example that Ryan just mentioned, our data scientists were so overjoyed when we went to Major League Baseball headquarters because they have this long, many decade culture of data and statistics. They have their data readily available. They know what their data means. The quality of their data is good. It was excellent. When we went to do these models, Right? We were easily able to work with them. It was a dream because they, it was, for our data scientists, the collaboration was fantastic. And that's, that's really what you want. You want to be able to get hold of the data, know what the data means, and to be able to incorporate it into your... The, you got that back up? Thank you. So, the, um, so it was fantastic to be able to do that. And um, that... Um, model that Ryan showed, we were able to do that in three weeks. And I'll talk a little bit later about how we did that in three weeks and how we came to that. But that's because of the organization that we're working with and that we're able to iterate quickly. The reverse situation is we are doing a forecasting model with a large multinational company that had missing values for their data and some negative values that didn't make sense. And it, and it was hard to do any forecasting without the, the quality and the provenance of the data. 
So it's a really important point to make sure you know where your data is going to come from and you know the quality and the provenance of your data. So the next slide is to um, equip your team with ML skills. When I was thinking about the slides and what order to put this in, typically you would think about training ahead of time, right? You want to, in the old waterfall model, to train and then get going. But with the iterative approach of machine learning, if you start out with the waterfall approach, you can, it can take too long. And truly, if you start out with an ideation session, know where your data is coming from, and then work to understand and learn, and we help our customers when we're doing those ideation sessions, I think that's, that's a really effective model that we've seen work several times. Now, when I talk about training, frequently people think, I mean training just the data scientist or just the IT folks. But really where the training I think is most important and most valuable is with the business folks because this is very different than old rule-based systems. With old rule-based systems, like accounting systems, you could just define that this debit is going into this account. For this credit, we're going to journal it to this account. It's very de well defined. Now, with machine learning, some business rule can't be hard and fast defined. Like what Ryan was talking about earlier with the marketing folks when asked, why did those 150,000 emails go to these customers, right? It was because the model told us. And um, that's, that's really important for the business leaders to understand how this is working and how to adopt it. And we found that, that it's really important to be able to convey that to the business leaders so they understand what it is that they're doing and how to, how to adopt it, how to get it, how to work with the data scientists. Now, training data scientists and your IT folks is really important too. We have a, a really um, a great tool called Amazon SageMaker that removes um, the heavy lifting, the complexity from using, um, uh, for doing machine learning for developers and data scientists so that they can step through each phase of the machine learning process from training models, excuse me, building models, training models, tuning models, validating models. It helps with every step along the way so that developers and IT folks can use machine learning much more expansively and successfully and get going much more quickly. So the, the next part is to iterate quickly. I've, I've talked about this a little bit before, but part of um, machine learning that's different than older ways of doing software when it was um, rule-based approaches is that when you start doing it, you're, you're going to be pulling in a lot of data. Your data scientists will be doing something we refer to as data wrangling. They'll be also doing feature engineering, which essentially is getting the data into the right format and using it in their models. They'll be trying different algorithms. They'll be running it multiple times. They'll be looking to make sure that they're tying back to those business outcomes. That's really important step, and that's a very iterative step. The important part is that they're doing that and able to iterate quickly. Now, one of the really neat things is about the cloud is that the cloud facilitates that. This is a really cool thing about the cloud is that you don't have to procure hardware. Right? So you can just get going quickly, start deploying or, excuse me, building models, training models, seeing if it meets your results. And if it doesn't, you can shift approaches quickly. Iterating is a really important part of the process. With Major League Baseball, we started out before we did the shift um, effect, of, excuse me, the, um, the um, stolen base prediction model. We started out with a, um, a model for predicting pitches. And because we iterated, we realized we, we thought the stolen base model was much more exciting for the fans because we started from the outcomes that we wanted and we, and we shifted gears quickly. And with the iterative approach, we were able to do that quite quickly. In another example, we have a healthcare and life science customer that's using machine learning in order to identify anomalies in medical images for kidneys. When they identify those anomalies, they can detect those and pass that informa information on to radiologists and pathologists. This type of machine learning to incorporate into a product or a business, you really need to iterate because those are really, really important types of capabilities. And by iterating, 
you can figure out how you can employ these new technologies into a product. Okay, the last one here is deploy and scale for production. This one's really important. As Ryan mentioned earlier, people focus on training with machine learning. It's really important that the training piece, so the, the attention's well deserved. But nine out of ten dollars are spent on production. And it's really important to think about production when you're going to move those models into production. So for business leaders, they need to understand that you need governance of those models. Because in the old way, you would put a system into production, it would be tagged in your source control system, or if you're using a CI-CD type of system, you would be able to track all the different pieces. But now we have a model that's in production, and the underlying data might not be captured with source control. And so you need governance on that, and you can be updating those models frequently as you're training them, because you, wanna, you have more data now, you wanna try to train tune and validate so you get better results, better predictions out of your models as you have more data. And so it's something to think about when you move into production. Using a tool like SageMaker for production is really important. SageMaker will automatically deploy your endpoints to multiple availability zones. You can think of availability zones as, as data centers on the order of tens of miles apart. It's really important that you do that because as IT folks, we want to make sure that we have availability, low latency, auto scaling, all those capabilities for inferencing that we expect out of our IT systems. I'll wrap up with a little anecdote here. When we moved that Major League Baseball stolen base prediction model into production, we did that in three weeks. And when that was going to go live on television shortly after, I um, asked the data scientists that, that worked on that, because you know, it's on television, that's really important. You want to make sure it's up and running. I asked the data scientist afterwards where it's running. And um, when she told me that it was running in SageMaker production in, in our Virginia region, deployed in three availability zones, I was like, ah, okay, I'm good. So I think we're out of time. I see the timer's down to zero. So. Um, I want to thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate it, and I hope you have a, a great rest of your day. And Brian, did you want to say anything to wrap up? Yeah, I'll just I'll give you guys with one last uh, thank you, Larry, very much. Oh, sure. I'll give you guys one last uh, sense of the art of the possible here. Uh, if you've ever uh, been to an F1 event, anyone? F1 is doing the same type of work that uh, we've talked about in the Solutions Lab, uh, and they're using it to make predictive models from the data on the cars. Uh, over 120 sensors with 1.1 million points of telemetry, building a machine learning model to do things like predict overtake probability. Uh, and if you want to understand what the most data-rich sport in the world looks like when machine learning hits it to enhance the fan experience, watch this video. This is real-time predicting the likelihood of an overtake or one car passing another car based on the car's performance, the driver's performance, which side they're favoring, where they are in the track. And that can happen now in split seconds. Uh, so if you think about anything else, there's all sorts of cool stuff uh, that we're doing here. But if the one thing I leave you with, uh, when you get started, there's a thing we called Amazon Machine Learning University. It is a training that we have used for years to train our Amazon developers and data scientists to become machine learning developers and data scientists. This last November, we released it publicly. It's free, anyone can access it, and anyone can use the same training we use internally at Amazon and AWS for your employees, and there's no multiple tracks for role base, and it's freely available, supported with certifications. Thank you so much. You guys rock for hanging out for the last session, and have a great rest of your time.